I'd like to show you how to translate this state machine hardware into a LabVIEW implementation. This will work either for a desktop VI or an FPGA target. We have a state register or the memory element. We have a next state decoder, which is combinational logic. The next state decoder combines the present state with the inputs to develop the next state value. This combined next state decoder and output decoder also develops the outputs. The state register is connected up to our system clock and it's also connected to our system reset. Now as in all digital circuit structures intended for the FPGA target, we begin by placing a while loop. And each iteration of the while loop corresponds to one cycle or one tick of our clock. The state register is our memory element. We can find that right here. This is the feedback node. When you change its direction, it has the same orientation as our state register. That is the D input on the left side, Q out output on the right side. Here's the initial value. And this specifically is the initial value on the very first iteration of the while loop. So physically in hardware, this corresponds to the power on reset value just after the bitstream file has been loaded on the FPGA. So this value is only used on the first iteration of the loop. The combined next state decoder and output decoder is nicely implemented by the case structure. We see initially that the case structure has two subdiagrams, and these are entitled true and false by default. And as soon as we connect the data type wire associated with our state register, we see that the panels are now indexed by state code. And again, at the moment, we just have those two subdiagrams or two case diagrams. Let's say that when we are in state zero, we always go to state one. Therefore, the case structure generates an output value of one, and that gets connected to the input of our state register. Now, if you look carefully here, when that tunnel has the white interior, that's your uh, indication that you have not established all possible cases yet. So every case has to be able to specify what the next state value should be. Now I'm going to go ahead and delete that one empty case and then duplicate the first one that I had finished. And, the case, and that duplicating technique is very nice because once you've got the basic structure figured out, then you save a lot of work when you create your, net, your uh, subsequent states. Also notice the tunnel now looks normal. It's uh, filled in with blue instead of having the white center. Let's go ahead and drop in some Boolean controls. And these will serve as our inputs. I'll go ahead and put down one more. By the way, I do a, when I did that copying or duplicating of the control, I was doing, uh, first I hold down the control button to do the copy, and then I also held down the shift button to keep it aligned as I uh, dragged it down for the second control. Let's also get some outputs. So in our first case, when we're in state zero, I'm going to generate an output called C. And another output called D.
And again, that's a control and then shift and then drag down for the copy that maintains alignment. Let's say in state zero that C is supposed to be active and D is supposed to be inactive. Again, now, that, now when we duplicate the case, we've already got most of the details figured out and we just need to adjust it for the behavior that we want in state one. In state two, let's say we want to advance to state three and then deactivate both C and D. I'll mention a handy technique here. Instead of maintaining the Boolean constants in every single diagram, we can make use of this option. We'll say use default if unwired. So that means if it's unwired, then it simply defaults to false. That way we only have to apply the constant where it's needed. Now here I'm using the uh, control and then middle or the scroll button on the mouse and that's a quick way of scrolling between the various cases. All right, let's give a little more variety here. When we're in state three, we want to advance to one of two possible states. We either want to go to state five or we want to go to state seven. We'll use a selector, which is equivalent to a two to one mux. And I'll use the A signal to indicate whether or not we should go to state five or to state seven. So the top option is when A is true and the bottom option is when A is false. Let's do a quick cleanup on that. And so here we've got a conditional transition based on the single input A. Now let's take a look at how you go about implementing the reset mechanism. Don't really have a good way of getting an asynchronous reset on the feedback node, but this is, I think, just as effective. This would amount to a synchronous reset. Using the data selector, I can establish a new signal called reset. And let me put that right next to the diagram here. Now when reset is active, then we interrupt the output of the case structure and then use the next state value zero. And I'll just use the same exact value that we used for the power on reset. However, if the reset is not active, then we simply use the output of the case structure. Now we still have at least one error. Let's see what we've got. Oh yes, we need to get the conditional condition terminal wired to something. And since I'd like to use this on the desktop for now, let me go ahead and put down the stop con control button there. All right, let's see, see how it looks. Go ahead and hit run. So of course, blinking lights are always fun to look at, but it's a little bit difficult to tell what's going on. Certainly if we press and hold the reset button, things kind of come to a stop. Definitely we need to slow down the loop. At the moment, it's just running as fast as it possibly can. So let me insert a time delay so that each, each loop iteration uh, can be specified in terms of the, the actual time in milliseconds. So this amounts to slowing our clock down, so to speak, so we can see things operate 
uh, much more clearly. So right now I've got it set up so we effectively have a clock period of one second. Now at the moment we can't see what's inside the state register. I'm going to go ahead and add an indicator so that way we can see exactly which state we're in. Let me do just a little bit of housekeeping there. There we go. The, uh, of course, the, the state that's inside the state register is of vital importance to be able to know where we're at. So I think now we can start to make a little bit more sense from uh, the, the behavior here. So we see that right now it's oscillating from states 1, 2, and 3. Let's just remind ourselves what that meant. In state three, we can go to either state four or we can go to state one. And uh, made a small modification there, if you recall. I think I had earlier four and five, perhaps. So now we see that when A is active, we branch to state four, and that takes us back to state zero. Speed things up a bit if you like. 